folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from our top secret research compound with another Watchman video broadcast. Revelation chapter 17, we're looking at Babylon's mystery. The Bible, and I, just think about the title of the word revelation. It's things that are revealed, things that are being told, things so that we can know what's going on. And you see that in Revelation 17, and there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. All these things, all these ideas, both a, I think, both a, a physical, uh, realm understanding as well as a spiritual realm understanding. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And here again, we've, and we're going to end up in the book of Ephesians. Later on, as we go through this presentation, we're going to end up talking about Christ and the church and how they, they are espoused to one another, and they will be married one, one day. Um, but here, she's just the opposite of that. She's not full of marriage and God's way and God's will and God's plan. She's full of the filthiness and abominations and fornication and adultery and whoredoms. That's who she is. She's just like the exact opposite. Her spirit is the exact opposite of the Holy Spirit. And let me just put this in here, and I don't know if I'll get a chance to insert this somewhere. As we're talking about Mystery Babylon, Mystery Babylon represents a spirit, and she you can see her all throughout the scriptures. Um, I remember several years ago doing the research on Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code. Um, just sort of, God just said, read it, and so I read it. I was looking at it, and I remember my jaw, I was sitting in an airport, my jaw dropped when I read about Shekinah, because I had heard, oh, the Shekinah glory is going to come down. We're going to get the Shekinah glory here at our church, bless God. I didn't know, I've heard that, I don't know where it came from, because I'm going, it's not in the Bible anywhere, maybe it's, I don't know, something, that, maybe something somebody found somewhere and they decided to put it in there. And I've heard good preachers say it, okay, good guys that I know love the Lord. A lot of times we just pick up things from other people and just parrot it and it ain't right. Found out what or who Shekinah really is. Number one, and I like to go over this information because People are always asking me, Pastor, what do you, you know, I hear about Shekinah. Where, where did you talk about Shekinah? So I like to keep it just sort of update. Number one, you will read from Genesis to Revelation in your Bible, King James Bible, and you'll never see the word Shekinah in there. Not, not one time. Some would say, well, it, it's in the original Hebrew. No, it's not there either. There is a, there is a word that's sort of related to that. Um, it is, I can't even pronounce it, it's the masculine form of this word. Shekinah is the feminine form of this word. Shekinah, and Shekinah does not appear anywhere in the Hebrew Old Testament. It doesn't exist. So here we have people, and they're talking about a glory from a spirit that's going to come down and into their church, and they call it the Shekinah glory. If it's not in the Bible, either in the English or the Hebrew or the Greek, if it's not there, then it's not from God. It's something different. It's, I'll just tell you who Shekinah is. Upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I may get into more details as we look at this, but in the, in the Jewish mysticism, Kabbalah, which is the religious principles that God said, don't learn them from the Canaanites and Babylonians. And they went, really? We can't learn about this? And they went and learned it. 
They took these things that basically Shekinah, the idea is, is that you have the male masculine form of God, who they call Yahweh, and you have the feminine spirit. In Greek, she is Sophia. Her name is Shekinah. And the teaching in the Kabbalah is when Yahweh and Shekinah fornicate, commit adultery, then the glory is released. See, isn't that disgusting? You see how she, Shekinah, Mystery, Babylon, Jezebel, you see how she's turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. That's what she does. That's one of the things that she does. We're trying to uncover what it is that she wants hidden, what she wants to keep a mystery. Her first name on her forehead is Mystery. And so one would think, well, we, we can't know about it. But he says later on, the angel that's showing John all this, um, he goes to John and says, um, what, what are you marveling for? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. I, you want to know the mystery? You want to know why mystery is written across her forehead? Well, I'll tell you. And this is what I believe that we're doing. We're looking at the scriptures. We're examining the word mystery. It's only in the New Testament, which if you know anything about how the Bible is laid out, the Bible clearly tells us, and we've covered a little bit, that there was a secret that Israel did not know. Now it's being revealed through the pages of the New Testament. Now we can have our eyes open and we can see what that mystery is. And part of that mystery has to do with Christ and He's dying on the cross and rising again. And there are other parts to that mystery that are being revealed. And so I remember as I began to study this and to put down these notes and kind of get everything uh, ready for this Watchman broadcast series we've been doing, I was, I was stunned. I was amazed at just how much information is packed into this old King James Bible that everybody wants to leave now. There's nothing left in there. Well, I'm going, wait a minute. I found all kinds of good stuff in there. You left some things here in the Bible, people. It's still here. It's good. And that's what we're doing. We're just, we're, everything that she tries to keep secret, God's Word is going to make manifest for us. He's going to open our eyes to it. He's going to, he's going to reveal it to us, all right? And that's the nature of God. We pick it up. We've been following the word mystery or mysteries throughout the King James Bible. It's all in the New Testament. And now we're at Ephesians chapter 1, and Paul used this in Ephesians several times. Here's the first place he talks about it. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9, the Bible says, Having made known unto us the mystery of His will. There, and see, stop right here. Stop, stop right here. The premise is, every time we see the word mystery in the Bible, it's not a mystery. It's revealed to us. I mean, look at this verse again. Having made known unto us the mystery of His will. Now, let me throw something in practical. Let me put in some really practical things for everybody, because I get asked a lot by people, Pastor, how can I know God's will? Pa how did you know that you were supposed to be a preacher, or how did you know you were supposed to be at this church, or you were supposed to do this? How did you know you were supposed to do the Watchman broadcast, or whatever it is? I just knew. God just sort of reveals these things to us. He uses His Holy Spirit to guide us and to lead us and to show us things that we are to be doing. Um, I look at it like, I think discerning God's will, God has made relatively easy. And I tell people this all the time. When Israel was traveling in the wilderness, they didn't know where they were going. They knew eventually they would be at the promised land, but they didn't know how they were going to get there. They were totally dependent upon the Lord. And so every day they would get up and they would look toward where the tabernacle was. And if the cloud was there at the tabernacle, that meant go about your business, do whatever it is you need to do, feed the goats, bathe the kids. Everybody were staying right here. But if they got up and they looked toward the tabernacle and the cloud had gone over across the way, over in the next field, God was so, God was so patient with these people. He would move that cloud and then he would wait because they all knew. You see the cloud gone, it's over there. 
that means we're moving today. And they would be in the process of packing everything up. The Levites would do according to what they were commanded to do with the ark and the tabernacle and everything like that. And God was just waiting for them. And when God moved, they moved. And if God didn't move, they didn't move. Now, I'm going to throw something in here that people try to use things as leverage against God's people to get them to do things, okay? And what am I talking about? I've heard all my life, maybe from well-meaning people who just didn't think about it, didn't study the scriptures. Well, God's waiting for you to make the first move. God's waiting for you to take the first step. God is waiting for you to do what he requires you to do, and then he's going to do something. I don't think it's like that at all. I think that if we are expecting God or we ask God to do something in our life, or let's say in our marriage or our family or in our, in our nation, if we ask God to do these things, shouldn't we then wait for God to do them and trust that God will either do what we asked him to do or something way better than what we asked him to do? Because that's God. That's what he does. And I just want to encourage you, maybe you'd be listening to this and you're like prophecy, so you're listening to this, but there is always a practical understanding here. God makes known unto us the mystery of his will. And so maybe you're waiting, maybe you've asked God to do something. Maybe you've asked God to fix something. Maybe you've asked God to fix you. And somebody said, well, you know, God's waiting for you to take the first step. You say, um, no, that's not how he led Israel. God didn't say, stay there in the tabernacle and say, well, are you guys going to get up and do something or what? I mean, I can't do anything until you do something. God never said that. They just knew. They looked over toward the tabernacle. If the cloud was gone, that's, that's when they knew that they were going to leave. It's as simple as that, people. God doesn't keep mysteries. If he has a will for my life and your life, I guarantee you, he'll show it to you. He'll reveal it to you because that's what he does. So anyway, here's what we're getting at. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might, look at this now, here it is. Here's part of the mystery. He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Now, I'm going to look at this. I, I, I like this. This is one of my favorite things in the, in the whole Bible to study. He talks about that God is dispensing grace right now. That's what a dispensation is. God is dispensing grace uh, to the Gentile world right now. And there's going to come a fullness of times. We'll say, what does that mean? Have you ever picked peaches? I do every summer. I love it. It's not good for diabetes to be eating fresh peaches and a lot of them. But there's an orchard not too far from here that you pay a price and they let you go and pick all you want to. I mean, you got to pay for what you walk out of there, but they don't mind you eating as much as you want. And how, do, how do you know when to pick the peach? You touch it, and it's just got just a little bit of give there in it. I mean, you mash into it, and you go, oh, that one's ready, okay? How does a woman know that she's going to have a baby? If she's not sure for the first few months, she knows for a fact the last few months, and that baby comes at the fullness of times. She can't get any bigger. And she can't carry that child around any longer. And then it's going to happen. That's, that's what's being said here. The dispensation of the fullness of times. And here's what God's going to do. This is part of the mystery. Because remember in 1 uh, Corinthians 15, 51, Paul said, I show you a, a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. We talked about that last week. So this is another aspect of that same idea. The mystery is, is that when it's time, when the fruit is ripe, when it's ready to be picked, when the harvest is ready, he's going to gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him. Um, I did a teaching on this a couple years ago called The Gathering. You can go look at that. 
But let me just run through some things very quickly here. In Matthew chapter 13, uh, Jesus gives us a couple of parables. One is the parable of the seed and the sower. And it's, you know, the devil comes down, eat the seed, or it's stony ground or thorns or, you know, good ground. But then he gives another story about a sower sowing seed. And he talks, this is the parable of the wheat and tares. And you go look at this. What happens is God sowed his good seed, but then his enemy, the devil, came and sowed all these tares in amongst it. So the servants are going, well, what do we do? We're going to, we just going to go through and get the tares now? And the husbandman said, no, because you do that, you're going to mess the weed up too. So here's what we'll do. We'll wait till it's harvest time. When it's harvest time, we'll know whose side, who's the tare and who's the weed. We'll know it. Now, I believe there's coming a day, people. It may be hard to discern who's really right with God, who is really saved for us. It may be hard to discern that. But I promise you there's coming a time when there's going to be a gathering taking place. Because you see, you go look at this in Matthew 13, and what you'll find out is that, that the commandment goes out to gather the tares first. And I want you to think about that. And then they're, they're, they're bundled together because they're going to be burned later on. And once those are gathered, then he starts gathering his people, the wheat. Uh, you see it also in Mark chapter 13, pretty interesting here. Um, he talks about that in verse 26, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. He's coming in the clouds, people. I love that. And then shall he send his angels. He shall gather together. That's what he's saying here. Gather together in one all things in Christ. Then shall he um, um, gather together his elect from the four winds from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. There is a, there's a match here. There's a connection between Ephesians 1 and, and Mark chapter 13. In 2 Thessalonians 2, he said, Paul said, I bese uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, he said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, uh, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by what? are gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, either by letter or whatever from us, is that the day of Christ is at hand. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. If you want a picture of this, I've used this illustration many times, if you want a picture of this, just go read uh, Daniel chapter 3. There they're all standing out in the plain of Dura, and the music is played and, and the commandment goes out that everyone has to fall and bow before this image that Nebuchadnezzar built with sixes all over it. 60 cubits tall, six cubits wide. You get the idea here. Well, there's a falling. Everybody that's on the devil's side is all laying down on the ground. And everybody that's on God's side is still standing up. Makes it pretty easy to figure out who's who, doesn't it? That same concept is here. Now watch this. Because we're gonna, what we do is we understand this mystery that God is going to gather together in one all things in Christ. We are gathered as his body. His, the, his body, we are his bride, his body. The two is going to become one flesh one of these days, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. Now, take that and understand that also there's going to be, there's going to be a gathering of God's people there is also going to be a gathering, just like in Matthew 13, a gathering of the tares, a gathering of all the wicked people in the world. I want you to think along the lines of, is there a push for a one world government? Correct. Is there a push for a common currency? You got it. Is there a, a push for a common religion? Yes, sir, e Bob. Is there a, a move to bring all the religions, all the peoples of the world, all the nationalities of the world, all together as one? We know it as the New World Order, the Novus Ordo Seclorum. That's what we know it as, but this is how the Bible's describing it to you. In 2 Thessalonians, there it is. I mentioned that earlier. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, is that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. Don't let Mystery Babylon mess your head up on this one. 
for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Matthew 24, 31, he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. That's what we're waiting to hear. They shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven and to the other. He's talking about here in 2 Thessalonians, the falling away is going to take place first. Now, Paul tells us in this passage, don't let anybody deceive you on this. Don't let anybody do it. And so what happens? Some of these Christian leaders who don't like that this says that there's going to be a falling away first because they've decided that they're going to be taken into heaven first and then everybody's going to fall for the Antichrist. And so this verse, well, it just kind of messes up the charts and they've already printed them out and it's cost them money. So we can't really go back and change the charts. We, that mean we were wrong about something and nobody buy our books anymore. So you know what they do? They retranslate 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, and then where it says, I come a falling away first. Um, Jimmy and Donnie Swaggart did this in the whatever is Bible that they put out. Somebody sent me a copy of it, and I'm just looking at it and going, oh, you've got to be kidding me. It's like every page of the New Testament in the Swaggart's whatever Bible. They say it's King James Bible now. But on just about every page in the New Testament, there's a note in there by one of the Swaggarts or one of their esteemed scholars saying, a better translation of this is. It's, it's actually, this is an in, a poor translation. What it really should say in the original Greek is this. And here's what they say about this one. I know I've talked about this before, but it's just so typical of what people do when they don't like what the Bible says, when it messes up their idea of what's going to happen in the future. Let's change the Bible. Ah, just rewrite it. That's that original, original Greek is what it really says. Here's what they say. They say that it doesn't really mean falling away. The word apostasia. You've heard of that word before, haven't you? Apostasy. They said really what it means is caught up. See what they did? They now say that it's not the falling away that takes place first. It's the caught, the catching up, the rapture that happens first. Now we're the now we're now we're correct, and now the Bible agrees with us. That's what they do, people. And God said, your Apostle Paul said, don't be deceived by this, because there is a gathering, and I believe one of there's actually two gatherings, and I believe one of them comes first. If you go back and study. Matthew 13, in the story of the wheat and the tares, it was the tares that was gathered first. When you go back and look at the plain of Dura, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't make a big scene before the music started playing. The music started playing, there was a falling away taking place, and now these guys end up with Jesus in the fiery furnace. Man, I like that. So let's don't change the Bible. Let's let the Bible change us. There is a gathering of the wicked, according to the scriptures. That's what takes place first. Don't let anybody deceive you. And don't let Mike Hogger deceive you either. You turn the video off. You go and take as long as you want to to study the Bible on your own. You have you have just as much right to know what this Bible says as I or anybody else in the world. The only difference between you and me is I have a big mouth, okay? And I like to talk to myself looking in the cameras all day long. Luke chapter 3, verse 16, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the weed into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with, un, with fire unquenchable. You see it there too, don't you? What did the disciples here on the day of Pentecost, a rushing mighty wind, 
What is it that shakes the fig tree in Revelation chapter 6 that causes the untimely figs to fall? The stars, those evil angels falling from heaven. A mighty wind. Here is John describing Jesus and he's got a fan in his hand. What is he doing? He's winnowing. He's blowing off. He's with that mighty wind. He is blowing off that chaff first. Then he takes the wheat and gathers it into his, into his uh, garner, into his barn. Do you know there was a picture of that too? There's a picture, there's a picture in the Bible of every doctrine, I think. Go read the story of Ruth and Boaz in the book of Ruth. When Ruth goes to meet Boaz, go find out what Boaz was doing. I think you'll like it, all right? So now, what does this have to do with Mystery Babylon? How is it that she's involved? Well, let's go back. Let's go back in, in ancient Egypt. Let's look at one of her pseudonyms, one of her many names, all right? She's known in the Bible. She's revealed to be mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. But she was known in other places in the world. Ashtaroth is how the Sumerians knew her and some of the other Mesopotamian peoples at the time. She was known as uh, Diana to the Greeks, Venus to the Romans. She was known by many names from many different cultures all over the world. In Egypt, she was known as Isis, the woman, all right? And the story is that Isis was the, the earth fertility goddess. Okay, you know what fertility involves. She was the earth fertility goddess, and she had a husband, and her husband was the sun god, all right? Osiris. And... Osiris was hated by another dog-headed god called Set. And Set killed Osiris and didn't want, his, didn't want him to be resurrected. So Set took Osiris' body and chopped it up into 14 pieces and then scattered it all over the world so that Isis could, but, she, and, but Isis did. She went around trying to gather all of the pieces of her dead husband Osiris so that she could look at it like this. She could put Humpty Dumpty back together again. You get that? Okay. And, I mean, here's these little graphics here of, uh, of Isis and her dead husband and Seth cutting him in pieces and feeding him to the crocodiles in the Nile River and all this stuff. But the story is, the main part of this is, is that Isis went to gather back all the pieces of Osiris and to put him all back together and to make him one again. Now, just again, just think about the opposite of this. Here is Christ and all of his disciples, all of his people, all of those who are saved, all of those who are in Christ, we are all over the world, people of God living everywhere in this planet. One of these days, the sound of the trumpet and the angels are gonna to gather together all of God's people into one body, all right? To be with Christ forever and forever and forever. Amen to that the opposite of that. Here is the dead God. And see, here's, get it, get this. In the story of Jesus and his church, it's Jesus that gathers the bride together. In this story, G, or there, the Jesus version of this, Osiris, is dead. And he's cut in pieces and scattered. He can't gather together anything. Isis has to do it for him. And I think Isis represents the collective spirit that's in mankind right now that is trying to gather everyone back together. Consider what they did at the Tower of Babel. And you get an idea of what's going on here. God at Tower of Babel scattered everybody, separated them by the uh, dividing of the earth, the uh, North and South America versus uh, Europe and Russia and China and Australia and Africa split apart. God divided everybody by language, by family, by tribe, by race. 
and then by geography. Isis, or Mystery Babylon the Great, part of her mystery is gathering everybody back together in some sort of secretive, magical way. I mean, take a look at this. Video games called Magic the Gathering. You've seen these bumper stickers, haven't you? That make me mad. Coexist, and it has all of these little emblems from all the religions of the world. And these people live in this little fantasy world that thinks that everybody in all of their religions can all get back together as one again. I happen to be a religious figure, and I know something about religions and religious ideas. Religion and religious ideas are exclusive to every other religious idea in the world. In other words, we don't like what the Muslims believe, and the Jews believe, and the Buddhists believe, and the Hindus believe, and the atheists believe, and the pagans. We don't, we don't agree with what they believe in. Mystery Babylon, you know what she's saying? Forget about what divides you. Let's just all coexist back together. So you have all these ecumenical gatherings. What happened in Rome? And again, Rome has been, for the last 15, 1600 years, 1700 years, Rome, the Vatican, has basically been one of the biggest epitomes of who Mystery Babylon really is. But I don't think she's limited to that. I think she is universal. I think you'll see Mystery Babylon in places other than the Roman Catholic Church. I really do. But here she is, 1963. Um, they have the Second Vatican Council. They're going to get together. And what did they come up with? All these cardinals and bishops from all over the world gathering together. What is their one goal? Let's put all of the religions under the umbrella and the blanket of our mother church, Mystery Babylon the Great. And let's stop killing all of these Christians. Let's stop doing that, all the Bible believers. Let's refer to them as separated brethren. And we're going to work, and we're going to put a spirit out there that's going to try to gather all of us all back together again. And so for years, you see news articles. It's the mainline denominations. It's the liberal crowds, the... Um, the Christian churches and the Methodist church and the Episcopal church and the Lutheran church and the Anglican church. All of the liberal crowd is joining hands with Rome. But then she starts making headway into some of the other denominations. And here's a picture here. You see it. Here is Cope and the Pope, Kenneth Copeland. And Francis, the talking pope, with John Arnott and his wife, and James Robeson standing there smiling in the back. He runs that big talk show on TBN, and basically everybody that's some kind of whacked out Christian person who has a book or a video to sell ends up on James Robeson's show, and he's show, and he's going to sell you the video for a discounted price for those who are watching this program. Robeson's a sellout, has been for a long time. Used to be a preacher. He sold out. All of these guys got together and went and visited the Pope. And they all sat down and ate breakfast and said, let's just all get along. Let's all work together. I don't know what all was talked about. I don't know what all promises were made to guys like Copeland and some of these other people. But the next time Kenneth Copeland brags about being full of the Holy Ghost, you remember that he sat there and held hands with Mystery Babylon herself in the form of the Pope. And the Bible says, Paul warned us, What? Know ye not that he that hath joined himself with a harlot is one with that harlot. You see how it works? She is gathering all of these people together under this one umbrella. Now, here's something else that's interesting about this. It says here, let's go back to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth. Now I want you to think about this. Christ is the Lord from heaven. He's going to descend from heaven with a shout. 
you and I are going to meet him. We're going to be gathered together and we're going to meet him in the air. Christ from heaven, us from earth. We receive a new spiritual body that doesn't have all of the ugly junk and the smelly smells that this old corrupt body has where it's all going to be brand new forever and ever and ever. Man, I can't wait for that some days. I want that to happen so bad. I'm looking forward to it. So here is, here is God and man finally together. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. But now watch this. Again, let's flip this upside down. Let's take this idea, gathering together heaven and earth together. Take a look at this. Here is a, um, some of these conferences you, they put on. One's called MOVE. See the Triketra there? where it says, where heaven and earth collide. You see that Triketra on there? I guess, yeah, that's what that is. The New Age Movement, the Aquarian Conspiracy, uh, Witchcraft, a, th a three-strand DNA is what that is. And um, the, you go to the conference and they're advertising, this is where heaven and earth <laughs> collide. Excuse me, when I read about Christ and the church being joined together, they didn't bump into each other. They didn't like ram into each other and bodies laying all over the place. That's not what happened. They didn't collide. They joined together similar to a husband and a wife, not that same way, but you get the idea. They weren't just bashing into one another like this is, what, this is what's being sold to the church people where heaven and earth collide. Here's, an, here's another part. Heaven and earth collide. The Savior for everyone has come, bringing the dead to life, all for the glory of your name. Did you see that? Bringing the dead back to life. It's like Osiris, and he's dead, and Isis says, if I can get all his pieces back together, he can live again. Here's another one, heaven and earth. You see the two circles and how they're joined together? You see that there? See that little image that they form in the middle? That image, where the two circles can join together, that symbol is called the mandorla. Mandorla is an Italian word for almond. It's because it has the shape of an almond. Now, I'm not going to get too particular with that, but that symbol, I've talked about it in other videos, that symbol is a symbol for the harlot woman. If you go to Google Earth or you look at an overhead picture of Washington's Monument, in fact I'll put it up on the screen here, picture of Washington's Monument, that's the missing piece of Osiris, that obelisk, it's Baal's shaft is what it is. And they've joined two circles together where that obelisk is forming the mandorla, the almond, that symbol is the symbol for Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. That's what that is. This is what's being sold to the church right now. I mean, how many, how many conferences has Pope, uh, Pope Francis joined? How many people has he got in contact with? Muslims and Charismatics and Lutherans and, and Southern Baptists and, and uh, Buddhist and people from every walk of life and every religion. He's trying desperately to get them all back together again. I'm telling you, it's being done under the hood or under the blanket of Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abomination to the earth. Now watch this in Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, you're going to see two groups here. You're going to see, you're going to see heaven colliding with earth. Get ready. Revelation 12, 3, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And then look at verse 7. There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. That is the collision of heaven 
and earth. Daniel chapter 2, the fourth kingdom is they, that fourth realm, that spiritual world, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places, joining together, mingling themselves with what? Man's DNA, the seed of men, literally. That's what they're doing. All this stuff about when heaven and earth collide, and let's have a conference where we're going to make heaven crash into earth. Here's another aspect of it. Oh. These people that do yoga, these, excuse me, these church members and pastors that are doing yoga classes in their churches. Uh, Manly Hall, I think, is a guy that said when a person does the yoga stance, they're making their body into a pyramid. They're turning themselves into a little triketra here. Here's the, you know, the base of the pyramid, and here's the, the all-seeing high there in your eye and your forehead. And you know what the word yoga means in, uh, what is it, Hindu or whatever? You know what the word yoga means? Connection. Connect. How many churches have you seen with that? Well, you've got to have a connect group. Well, let's, we're gonna, let's connect with one another. Come to our church and we'll, we'll connect with heaven. You watch that because 99 times out of 100, they're going to do it without the mediator, Jesus Christ. They're going to connect. They're going to collide with heaven and be joined together. So the, that part of the mystery is... While God's revealing to us, plainly in the scriptures, that he's going to gather together all those who are in Christ. Heaven and earth doesn't matter. They're all going to join together and be his, his body and live with Christ forever and ever. The opposite of that is there's also a gathering and a collision of what's in heaven. These angels that the dragon takes his tail and scoops down one third of the angels and they fall down to the earth. This is heaven and earth colliding. And I think at this time, they're going, to, uh, they're going to connect, okay? That's what I think is going on. Now, we move through Ephesians chapter, uh, in Ephesians chapter 3, we see another aspect of what this mystery is. I told you, Paul mentioned the word mystery several times in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3, Paul said, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery... As I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not known or made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Here it is, verse 6, is another aspect of the mystery. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. And this part of the mystery, you got to say amen to that. I mean, think about it. The Old Testament was basically the, the history of the Jewish people, starting going from Adam through Noah down to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 tribes. All the wonderful things that God did with them back then and all of the times that they just absolutely despised God and rebelled against Him. And yet God in His loving kindness and His mercy toward Israel, He says in Deuteronomy 7, what, do you th think I picked you because you're the greatest nation in the world? No. I picked you because I loved you. I loved you like, like you're my own children. I loved you. And I care about you and I want to do things for you, but you're so rebellious. And every time I do something great for you, you turn and worship Baal and Ashtaroth. They're still worshiping Baal and Ashtaroth to this day. You remember I was talking about Yahweh and Shekinah? And the Sephiroth, the tree of life, that little mystical symbol that has like three pillars in it and all these... 10 circles and all these lines going all over the place like serpents and you cannot understand anything about the Kabbalah. But there's a little bit I get because they say that this pillar here represents Yahweh, the male, the masculine. This pillar over here represents Shekinah, the woman. And they're joined together, get it, to do this little fornication thing. They're, they Heaven and earth collides here and they join together and that's their idea. But really, what, what, what they're worshiping is, it all goes back to what they learned back in the Old Testament. 
Baal and Ashtaroth because that's what Baal and Ashtaroth did. They collided a lot. The Jews to this day following the Kabbalah and the Zohar and the, the mystical Judaism as it were. Those uh, Hasidic Jews you see with the hats and their little curls in their hair and all that stuff and they're I used to think they were just bowing before the Wailing Wall. Uh, no, they're doing other things, acting that out. You're going, oh, I didn't know that. Go look at YouTube, go watch videos of them and you'll go, oh, that is so not right. Where did they get that from? Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. But anyway, here's what I'm getting at. The Old Testament was all about Israel. God came from, down from heaven, met with Israel at Mount Sinai. He, Moses came up. He gave him his fiery law. Moses was the mediator between the Israelites and God. And God gave to Israel the laws, the law of God. He said, don't break it. Here's my covenant with you people, with Israel. And they said, absolutely, we'll do all that stuff. That didn't last very long, did it? They were down there breaking every one of those commandments as Moses was coming down with the tablets in his hand. They were down there breaking them. But watch this now. So God says to Israel, you know what? I bid you come to the wedding. This is that parable Jesus told. I bid you come to the wedding and you said you couldn't come. So I went out to the highways into the hedges and I compelled them that would come. And I found, I found poor people. I found people that didn't have anything better to do. I found people that everybody else had rejected, and I brought them to my wedding. You know what that is? That is God saying, Israel, the Jewish people, sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you guys just go sit down in a corner for a while while I save me a bunch of Gentiles. And that's what he did. And it, Paul talks about it so beautifully in uh, Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, here's Paul, and he says, boy, I, I wish for my people... Paul was a Jew, and he's going, I wish uh, uh, that my people would be saved. And he says, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. God hasn't cast away the Jews. I, I'm one of them. God's going to do it one of these days. And then he gives that beautiful study. You go study this on your own. That beautiful picture of the tree. And here we have the olive tree. We have the natural branches, which is the Jew. Jesus. Guess what he was? He was a Jew. And all these natural branches on there. But Israel refused to believe what God said. So you know what God did? Pulled their branches off, cast them away. And he went and looked at us wild Gentiles. How would you like to go to heaven for all of eternity and not burn in hell forever? That's what I want to do. God grafted us in. Isn't that beautiful? That's part of the mystery he's talking about. He said the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body. So here we are. We're grafted in. We're not grafted in. This is very important. Some say, oh, that tree is, is, is the Hebrew identity. No. That tree is Christ. I am the vine, you're the branches. Remember that one, John 15? He's grafting us in as wild vines as wild sticks, and he's putting us in, grafting us in. I don't know how they do all that, but they take something and they put it in there and they tie it together, and now it's in there. And now, you and I who are just rotten Gentiles, we get to draw from the richness and the fatness of the olive tree. We get to enjoy the blessings of being in Christ. That's part of the mystery. I love that. But is God done with Israel? Oh, no. Because God said, uh, you see how easy it was for me to graft you wild Gentiles in? How much easier do you think it would be for me, if Israel chooses to believe, to graft them back into their own tree? Of course it's going to be easy to do, and God's going to do it. But that part of the mystery is that so we are grafted in to the fullness of Christ not just the Jews, not just Israel, but us with them. That's what he said, the Gentiles, fellow heirs, and of the same body. Now, in the Old Testament, it was the Jews alone. New Testament, we're grafted in. We are partakers of the covenant and the promises, uh, and that tree is Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to say something, and I have a 
flawless track record of being in support of the salvation of the Israelites. Twelve tribes, God's going to save them once again. He's going to seal them. It's what we see in Revelation chapter 7. He's going to save them. He's going to redeem them. He's going to take a remnant from each of those tribes, like a tithe, a tenth. He's going to bring them and, and restore them and give them salvation. Okay? I love, I believe what God told Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, and God, and God has not ever broke that covenant, and He's not going to. That's what I believe. Now, I say all that to say this. It dawned on me one day, reading through the, and doing a study of the book of Acts, we did it at Sunday school years ago. The biggest haters of the gospel of Jesus Christ was the Jews. Paul Everywhere he went, he had to deal with the angry synagogue leaders and the angry Jewish mobs that were wanting him killed and the Jewish people that were stirring everybody else up and the Jewish people that were trying to get the Roman governors and people to kill Paul. Why don't you kill him? He's... Paul used to be one of them. He knew what they were like. And even, you, you go look in, um, oh, let's see here, the book of Galatians. And the Apostle Paul, the Jew, is given us that allegory of um, Hagar and Sarah. And he says, we are, we're born from heaven. We're Jerusalem above is our mother. We're born from her and we're born free. But those who were born at Mount Sinai, the Jew who received that covenant, they're in bondage just like Ishmael was with, with Hagar. And watch this now. He says... Um, Verse 29 of Galatians chapter, uh, Galatians chapter 4, But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. I think that there is, well, I'm going to sound like some wackos on the internet. I absolutely believe according to the Word of God that the fiercest enemies of the true gospel of Jesus Christ, of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, the biggest haters and the biggest enemies of that are Jews. And I think that they, have, they will stop at nothing to deceive, to coerce, to entice. Instead of Gentiles, believers, being a witness to the Jews, because God clearly said in the Scriptures that one of the reasons why He saved the Gentiles is that one of these days He's going to provoke Israel to jealousy, just like Esau with Jacob. And so you know what? And how's He going to do that? God is going to provoke Israel by putting His glory on the Gentile believers without keeping the law, guys. Gentiles don't keep the law. And I saved them and put my glory on them. What do you think about that? And it's supposed to make Israel jealous. So you know what's going on? The exact opposite. I want you to look at this, okay? I think the Jews and evil Jewish people have a conspiracy to go in and to destroy the gospel of Jesus Christ of salvation by grace through faith and all the Gentile churches, all the Gentile ministries, and to make them think that if they really want to be in God, they have to go be Jewish. Take a look at it. Things like we've talked about, the divine spark, okay? Honi, the circle maker, you remember that? Uh, Hebrew root, sacred name is, I mean, we look at all this, we have the divine spark. Um, and you see that everywhere. The book's called The Divine Spark, A Miracle of Human Transformation. Spark Outreach. That's, you know, the, the, the whole idea of the divine spark, it came from the Kabbalah. And it's in churches. Now, you have churches with what's called ignite groups. And we're going to ignite and we're going to spark this and we're going to spark that. ABC's programming schedule is called Spark ABC. The Transformer movies. What is it that gives life, that cube that gives life to any form of electronic? It's the AllSpark, isn't it? Mm -mm -mm. Think of the Tesseract and the Avenger movies and Thor and all that stuff. It's the same concept. It's, that's a, you're looking at a picture of the Antichrist. 
And the whole idea of the divine spark now is creeping in. It's creeping in mainstream thought, non-Jewish thought. And people are thinking about this. The movie, Bruce Almighty. Morgan Freeman is God. You ever notice Morgan Freeman? If there's ever any kind of movie about human evolution and human be humans becoming God, Morgan Freeman's in it. That's what he believes. Okay, I think he does this on purpose. But anyway, you have all this stuff about the divine spark. You remember Honey the Circle Maker. We talked about that in uh, dealing with uh, witchcraft and so on, witchcraft in the church. And here's this extra biblical story that Mark Batterson took. He didn't get it from the Bible. He got it from Jewish fables. Titus 1.14, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Why? Why is this spirit trying to promote Honey the circle maker and the divine spark idea and all this stuff. It's to turn people, Gentiles, from the truth of the Word of God. You don't have to turn Jews away from it. They're already away from it. But we got to go after all the Gentile churches and the Gentile believers. And Mystery Babylon the Great is at the heart of that. Whereas Paul had the mystery revealed that the Jews are joint heirs and fellow heirs, in other words, equal to the Jews who are redeemed and saved and all being part of the same body of Jesus Christ. The Jews take that, flip it upside down. Mystery of Babylon flips that upside down and says it's not Christ that you're supposed to be a part of. You're supposed to be part of the Jewish people. You have to go back and follow the Torah. Here's one. Here's a ministry called Restoration of Torah Ministries. Here is, I talked about this, here is Jim Staley. He's like the Pope of all the Hebrew Roots people. He's trying to bring it mainstream, and it's working really well. He's got in cahoots with Joseph Farah of World Net Daily. And, um, and, I mean, he's trying to make it big now with his Hebrew Roots teaching. And here he is. I, I've suspected for a while when I started looking into him, that he was getting his concepts, not from the Old Testament, but from Jewish mysticism, the Kabbalah. I wrote an article about him. It's on my blog, PastorMikeHogger.com. You can go look, you go search for it, the, the true whatever roots of Jim Staley's gospel. He gets it from the Zohar, the Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism. And then lo and behold, he's going to give you this teaching on the Trinity. And it's on YouTube. You go look at it. Trinity on Trial, Part 4, 4, Passion for... Truth, quote unquote, ministries. And Jim Staley says, now here's the real Trinity. This is how the Jewish people believed it. The real Trinity is here is Yahweh, the Father, and Holy Spirit, the Mother. And they had Jesus in the middle. And he used the image of the Jewish Sephiroth, the tree of life, Baal, and Ashtaroth. And when they fornicated together and the glory was released, they had a child. His name is Antichrist. That's who that is. And Jewish mysticism, now, and Jim Staley, by his own testimony, used to be an associate pastor at, I don't know, some kind of, some kind of evangelical church. And all of a sudden... He got a vision from God. God downloaded all this special knowledge to him outside of the Bible. And now he's telling, and he, you got to watch these guys. They're so slick. They'll say on this side of their mouth, we believe, of course we believe salvation by grace. And you have to keep the law. They're double-minded. They talk out of both sides of their mouth. They're confusing people. But they, they're just slick enough to make people think that the only real way to please God is by going back and pretending that you're keeping the Old Testament law. And they're not. James said, if whoever offends the law in one point, he is guilty of all. And for those of you who say, well, I keep the feast days because that's on Yahweh's calendar. That's what I do. Remember the rule. If you offend the law in one point, you've ruined the whole law. You're guilty of breaking the law. 
If you don't have a plane ticket that says you went to Jerusalem for Passover, you didn't keep the law. You pretended that you kept the law, but you didn't keep the law. And that's what these people are trying to make believe, everybody, is we just go, if we, God, of course God is pleased when we keep the law. That's how you please God, is that you try to keep Yahweh's law. Really? Let me show you how a Jew told other Jews what pleased God. Book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. It's not works that please God. God's not impressed by what we do. He goes by, do we believe what He said? But you sort of get this idea. Then we have the sacred name people. Uh, I say Yahshua. I say Yahashua. Oh yeah, well I say Yeheshua. I say Yahweh, where I say Yahweh or Yahuwah or Yad whatever. They even fight amongst themselves about which really is the sacred name and how to really pronounce it. What's wrong with calling him, I don't know, Jealous? Because God said that's his name, Jealous. What's wrong with calling him Most High? What's wrong with calling him Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace? What's wrong with calling him by those names? They see all of this is part of a Jewish idea that wants to infiltrate into Gentile churches, Gentile Christianity as it were, and make them come back to the mother, which is Israel of the Old Testament and put them under the bondage of the Old Testament Mount Sinai law. Now, here's something you could do, and I don't have it prepared today, but I've done it before. Go read Deuteronomy 28, because that's really the, the covenant that God made with them, that as a nation, as a people. And God said, Deuteronomy 28, if you keep all my statutes, Blessed shalt thou be in the city, blessed shalt thou be in the field, blessed, and God said all these blessings are going to be on there. And then God said, if you do not keep all of my commandments, here's what I'm going to do to you. I'm going to turn your heaven into iron, your earth into brass, and then I'm going to send a nation to you from the north, as swift as an eagle flies, a nation of fierce countenance. You know who that is? Go read Daniel because Daniel talks about a king of fierce countenance who's coming. A nation of fierce countenance whose tongue thou shalt not understand. That nation of fierce countenance is what's in the pit now in Revelation 9 when that door gets opened and those devil hordes come out, the locusts, scorpions, and like horses and faces of men and hair of women. That's the nation that God is going to send to those who do not keep the law. Jim Staley, Monte Judah, Mark Biltz, who started this whole four blood moons nonsense. Perry Stone, one of the biggest of them, trying to tell everybody to go back and be Hebrews so that you can really honor God that way. And that is not what God tells us as Gentiles. He tells us, keep being Gentiles. Just believe what I said, and I'm going to use you who do not do the works of the law to provoke to jealousy those who pretend that they do. So you understand now what, this, what part of Mystery Babylon is doing. She is infiltrating into churches, seminaries, Bible colleges, conferences, quote-unquote Christian websites, Christian newsletters, Christian, um, Christian radio programs, Christian TV programs, all of them. There is a massive push to get everybody to go back to their Hebrew roots. That's what Mystery Babylon is doing right now. And you need to understand this. 
when you are truly saved and you're relying upon grace through faith alone to bring you the blessings of Almighty God. Going back now to Mount Sinai and to be put under that covenant is the equivalent of committing adultery against Jesus Christ. Because you're going back to that day, putting yourself under that covenant once again. And there is nothing there but a curse. And everything in this New Testament tells you that. And in case you're wondering, well, you say, well, you know, I've listened to them and they explain, you know, the New Testament like this. Let me ask you something. When you're watching these guys, do they just tell you, see what's in your Bible? Believe every word in the King James Bible in the New Testament, and that will show you and guide you into the truth. Do they do that? No. They say, now what you're reading here, the mainstream Christianity has paganized this. They've used the Greco-Roman pagan ideologies and concepts to turn this all around against it. Even though it says it this way, what it really means is, and then you're sucked in by the words that come out of their mouth, which it's all going to be, go back to Mount Sinai and get under that covenant and that contract. They're pretty slick. They're good at doing what they're doing. And they have a spirit that's guiding them, that's allowing them to deceive millions of people. I'm imploring you, don't be deceived by her. Don't be taken back to Mount Sinai. Don't fall backwards, going back to the Old Testament law. Paul said, forgetting those things that are behind, I press toward the mark for the prize and the high calling in Christ Jesus. Our future people as God's people, it's not back in the Old Testament. It's ahead toward Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. God made salvation exactly that simple. Will you believe? what God said. Will you come under the terms of a new covenant? Jeremiah 31, 31. Will you believe what God said? I hope you do. Hope you don't fall for Mystery Babylon's mystery and end up going back under a curse. God help us all. It's Pastor Mike. I've got, even today, I'm adding some things in here that I'm just excited to get out, okay? All about Babylon's mystery. So I hope you'll long suffer with me and I will be sharing these in the days to come. All right. God bless you. I'm enjoying this study just for me. I'm enjoying it. I hope you're enjoying it too. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.